Welcome to Bite Size Dental Marketing. Today I have Eric Suarvar with me. Eric, from Midwest Dental to the the two hour startup dentist, I would love to hear your origin story, my man. Yeah, Eric, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'll kind of get started. So my associate and I, Richard, we were meeting with a dentist at a, a local coffee shop in McKinney, Texas. And, uh, you know, we were just kind of chit-chatting back and forth with the dentist, just kind of trying to figure out what his timeline was uh, for developing property and developing mm -hmm. a dental office and becoming an entrepreneur. And he, he kept saying, hey, my space is going to be ready in a few weeks. My space is going to be ready in a few weeks. And uh, which was a little bit of concern. This was pre-2020. So you only needed about four weeks before install to really order equipment. Uh, but I still at that time like to do it about about eight weeks. And uh, he's like, no, my space is going to be ready in about four weeks. And so, uh, you know, I said, well, we got a lot to decide on. I said, where's your space going to be at? And he pointed to directly across the street from where we were. And it was a dirt lot that had just been cleared, which, <laughs> which, which just blows my mind. Because, you know, at that point, he was at least nine to 12 months away from being able to take over mm -hmm. the shell space and develop it and finish out the interior and take equipment. But his expectations were there was going to be a building there in four weeks that he could put dental equipment in. Wow. And, 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 and to say that with a straight face on a podcast just blows me away because even to this day, so I, I actually kind of started coaching him a little bit and really, you know, after the four weeks came by and the dirt lot didn't change and, you know, uh, you know, he did have an LOI signed, but he backed out of it. You know, he, he was an individual that instead of getting a sale on, I actually try to keep him in the corporate dentistry for a couple more years so he can really develop as a clinician and really as a mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. So yeah, crazy, craziest thing ever. And so, you know, at that moment, I really realized that, you know, the expectations of just developing a business and, and the path of becoming an entrepreneur uh, had many paths, but also, you know, everybody's kind of all over the place on it. They don't know where to get started. They don't know, you know, you talk to a real estate agent first, you see if you can afford it first, you talk to your CPA. And so I really put together a program uh, that we could speak to in two hours uh, called the two hour dental startup. And so that's kind of how it started. What are the most common issues you run into? You, you know, what's kind of funny is probably five years ago, eight years ago, the dentist used to start with a financial institution for the loan process. But now dentists are so, and this is you know specific to my market here in DFW, but dentists are so um, concerned about the site location that they actually start with a real estate agent first, which is fine because um, they're picking out a space. But you know it's really important in order to, to acquire that space and for the landlord to actually take you serious as a tenant and to take your uh, your LOI serious, is it's important to have a, uh, a financial letter from a financial institution saying that you've been pre-qualified for a loan. I've seen dentists mm -hmm. actually come across amazing spaces only to lose them because they were in the lending process to, to see if they qualified for a loan. And another dentist comes in and puts an LOI on that space and gets it. I'm, I might get into a little political trouble here that you may have to help me get out of, Eric. Okay. I'm on the marketing side, obviously. And yeah. In there, I'm generally the last person brought in of, I have my equipment and I have my building and I have my computer system and I have my coach and, you know, oh my God, I got, I need some patience now. And, you know, I got like $72 left over from marketing, <laughs> but set that aside. Yeah. One of the things that I constantly hear on my side is the dentist talk about how my realtor said my office is going to be a $2 million office. And, and, you know, I, I happen to know because, you know, I mean, we're in DFW too, that there's seven other dentists who've approached me in Frisco or in Plano or wherever it may be. What is happening in that cycle that, that, and, and I hate to say a lie, but because I, again, that's made the political mess that I'm stepping in. What are dentists being told as they get into those locations? And, and I'm fascinated that I've never been that I, I'm only on the back end of, sure. you know, th that, that event. Sure. So let, let's talk about, I believe it's uh, Independence and 121. There's 11 dentists on one corner. And if you're in the real estate business in DFW, you know this location well. If you're in dentistry, you know this location well. All of these spaces popped up within months of each other. Mm -hmm. A lot of it had to do with the fact that that location looked amazing on paper for about six months. 
And then after six months, because the demographics, there's a lag time, Dennis started going in and getting popped in there. And, you know, what it really does, and I'm, I'm going to actually bring it back to, to really what you do, is a lot of dentists need to do their own personal homework when it comes to not, not really just the space, but they need to educate themselves on who they're marketing to. You know, there's a huge difference in going in to Frisco, Texas, than there is in going into Hallsville, Texas, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so if you're going to actually make a decision as an entrepreneur to go into such a competitive market, okay, I believe it's called monopolistic competition is what that's actually called. Mm -hmm. Not a monopoly, but monopolistic competition, I think is the marketing word. Um, and it's going to be heavy, heavy, heavy competition. You need to be prepared to really carve out a large marketing budget. Well, if that's the case, it's probably important to meet with a marketing firm such as yours early on and say, hey, I'm sure you have clients in this area. What does it take to carve out my piece of the pie in this area to be a $2 million practice? You know, and I, the, the spend on that marketing element in Frisco is going to be completely different than the spend. Oh, yeah. Completely mm -hmm. different. And, and, and if they're not prepared to really, you know, spend that amount of capital on the front end, and it's going to be difficult. And as you know, Eric, I mean, it's a, it's a perpetual spend. It's not something that you spend $75,000 year one. And then guess what? Year two, you spend $5,000. No way. I have had some DSOs ask us, where should we put our next location? Yep. But at a private office, um, I've, I don't think I've ever been asked the question. Yeah. And the irony is I would tell them the places that are not sexy, the yeah. Our biggest offices, our most successful offices are in Copper's Cove, Corsicana, uh, Gainesville, yep. uh, Wichita. Like, like everybody wants to be in South Lake. Everyone wants to be in Frisco. Yep. But Roanoke is great. And Melissa and all those places, those are where some of our highest growth offices come from. I'm going to turn to be the interviewer here for Let's a second. Let's do it. Let's oh, do it. I love this. So I actually identify this in, in my, the book that I wrote called The Dental Startup. Cheap plug there. Um, but I ident identified really there's just two marketing type practices left. One is what I call um, a marketing based dental practice, which is in Frisco. You're going to have a high, high spend. And, you know, the, the tons of negatives are your overhead's expensive, your labor's mm -hmm. expensive, mm -hmm. your real estate's expensive. You have to spend, you know, a, have a hefty marketing budget. What's the benefit of, of having a community based one? That, that's what I call like Melissa and, you know, a lot of these underserved communities. What's the benefit? For me, the benefit is if you live near there, mm -hmm. I think your qual your overall quality of life is going to be much less stressful. For sure. I think your employees are going to be around. Let, let's assume that they're the same level of operator, right? The same clinician, the same, you know, level. I think you're going to have a longer tenured employees, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just the supply and demand at, at play. I think your lifetime patient value is going to be significantly higher. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably dealing with less transient population than you are in some of the Frisco's and the Plano's that, that, you know, have, you know, higher turnovers and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, I think you're gonna make more money because you have a lower overhead. I think your marketing budget is going to max out at, you know, three, three and a half percent where I think in Frisco, you're going to be into the six to eight potentially. Yep. And I do think in Frisco, I mean, we have had guys like, like Brent Cornelius is in Keller, in, incredibly competitive. Um, and he has built a brand that, that he, you know, does have a lower marketing budget and does very, very well, but that's uh, 15 years in. That's right. Not, uh, not zero through five. Not yep. not zero through ten even, yep. Um, and I, I think that it's more forgiving as well in the business side. I think you can make more mistakes in those community areas because I think you're developing your brand. And I say mistakes, not clinical mistakes, but but, but business mistakes. Yep. I think that you're building your brand. I think I think if you get into a bad situation with lease or lease or whatever, it's easier to move. Like, I think it just takes the whole body of work and just makes it easier for you to operate and be successful. We do partner with some CPA firms that we do a co CFO, CMO, dentist mm -hmm. marketing meeting. Our most profitable practices are typically in secondary markets. 
I, I, I want to add one more positive thing to that, that, that every dentist wants to hear, which is you don't have to take every insurance that, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's amazing. Right. You know, I'm not competing with everybody else. Yep. You're not competing with everybody else. And so in, you can do the procedures you want. Think about it. Like the dentist that there's four dentists in one town. If you want to place implants as a general dentist, you know, and a lot of specialists are going to scoff at that and I apologize, but it, it it's relatively easy to do that in these smaller towns without a problem, mm-hmm. without yep. a problem. Or if you don't want to do any of that and just do bread and butter dentistry, that's a choice too. Yeah. I, it, it, I think it just takes the, all of the things around owning your practice become easier yep, and ultimately improve your quality of life. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which by the way, I just want to have a disclaimer here. 99% of all my business is in the DFW area, which is a competitive market area. It's, mm-hmm. so, so, so a lot of the stuff that I'm discussing is based on when I was traveling as a manufacturer at prior, you know, cause I, I, I used to call me, you know, everything from Shreveport all the way down to Fort Stockton and up to uh, Kansas city, you know? And so I've seen a lot of small town dentists and those guys are mayors. Those guys are sit on the town council. They own sections mm-hmm. of land, you know, heads of cattle. I mean, it's, it's totally different in those marketplaces. It really is. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. What are you doing today to, when you talk to folks about the two hour dental startup? Like, are, are you bringing them in? Are you doing it virtually? Walk me through the program, if you will. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we haven't really had one since COVID. Um, we're fixing the schedule ours for the end of the summer. Uh, but previous before COVID, what we were doing is, is we would bring them into just a, a restaurant with a, a private room. And uh, typically it was, you know, the, the sweet spot where, where entrepreneurs are comfortable is between 10 and 15. That's when they really share their goals. Hmm. I just kind of kick it off about just kind of mindset and goal awareness. You know, I think it's important to really uh, uncover what their goals are as a practitioner, you know, are their goals serving them or are they serving their goals that, you know, that really determines happiness. You know, I can meet a dentist. that's like, yeah, I want to make $250,000 my first year, but they could be miserable making $250,000, um, you know, their first year. And so, so it, it's, let, let's talk about headspace a little bit and see if you're prepared. You know, if you're you know, planning a marriage or planning divorce or anything silly, uh, that's life changing that you can't unrewind. Maybe right now is not the time to become. Mm-hmm. And then the secondary step is, is really, we, you know, we like to I bring in a, a financial, not advisor, but uh, a representative from a financial institution. Uh, and she typically talked about, uh, you know, what it takes, what they look for in a loan goes over what a business plan is. Um, now I currently, uh, you know, a lot of clients that I do startups with, they'll, uh, I'll advise them on business plans and how to write it and what the banks are looking for. But um, typically she'll go over like, Hey, this is what we look for in a business plan. This is what we look for in savings. We do understand that you're going to have debt because you are a higher educated individual that's going to have some student loan debt, but you know, do you have any bad debt? Do you have any claims against you? And that, you know, that's, so she, you know, she or he were talking about what it takes to clean up, to be ready to be a business owner. And then, uh, you know, the big benefit is, is really bringing in a CPA as well. You know, I enjoyed bringing in a CPA and they can talk about, you know, p- particularly just the structure of uh, how to set up, uh, you know, is it going to be a proprietorship, which of course it's not LLC, uh, you know, how are you going to set up your entity? And then uh, William Cruz would come in, he worked with me at Midwest Dental and he would just talk about the design aspect of it. You know, it's important mm-hmm. to discuss why you're putting a mechanical closet in the back of the dental office instead of the front. Um, and believe it or not, we've seen some designs where they're like, no, we, you know, I want to put this towards the front. It's like, Uh you're going to be on the phone. You don't want a loud mechanical closet in the front. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, then he would of course go over the the construction process as well. And then I would go over particularly the equipment. You know, it's kind of funny, you know, when you meet a dentist and they've worked somewhere for so long, they refer to two, two things when it comes to their equipment, what they had in dental school and their favorite place that they've worked since dental school. And typically they can't tell you the name of the equipment. And so really it, it, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. So a lot of times we try to you know, okay, we'll do, have more higher level discussions about not brands of equipment, but you know, how the style that they like to practice, 
You know, there's, do you like a breakaway style where you have the smaller rooms and, you know, there's no ceiling or no ceiling overhead light. Uh, do you have a handheld x-ray or do you like larger surgical suites uh, with 12 o'clock or do you like over the patient? And, and a lot of times, you know, we start uncovering conversations about the patient experience. And a lot of times dentists will go, well, I don't want anything on the chair because I don't want it to draw apprehension and anxiety to the patient. And so, you know, that a lot of that has to go into the design process too. And it, it goes into how they pick out equipment, what equipment they use. Then of course, uh, we do have uh, an element, of course, with a little bit of insurance. And uh, there's a section of my book, I like to talk about direct contracts and shared agreements within insurance versus an umbrella company. And most of them are financially ready. Most of them know that they have, you know, where they're at financially. But when it comes to headspace and, and really, you know, are they ready to really take that entrepreneurial risk plunge is a, is a huge, deep, long conversation. Now, in the pre-show, we talked a little bit about the man who loves the walk will go further than the man who loves the destination. Yeah. What is it through those items that you just laid out that you think they should really embrace and learn to love the walk on? Mm. You know, I'm going to say headspace, honestly. You know, I mean, it's it, so I listened to a podcast recently where, uh, you know, who Rick Rubin is hmm? the former. He was a producer. He produced everything from Drake to Tom Petty, but he's never played an instrument in his life. And, uh, you know, a lot of times he'll just lay down on a couch and they'll play music for him and he'll say, adjust this and tweak that. And voila, you know, you've got just just amazing music. And so it, it's kind of the same thing. It's like you've got to really find out internally what you're trying to achieve. Because the, the business aspect of it's going to be the hardest thing for the dentist, mm -hmm. but it will take care of itself. It's it's what's going to make them happy at the end of the day. You know, you, you have your buckets at once, you know, they'll fill up the bucket of money pretty quick, you know, within the first zero to five years. But why do you really want to own your practice? Do you want to control your schedule? Do you want to serve your community or do you want your practice to serve you as an entrepreneur? For me, that's my favorite part. I, I spend half my time trying to talk them out of being an entrepreneur dentist. And, and I know that culturally no one, or at least not a lot of dentists that I know get into dentists to go work for someone else. I think part of the, part of it is owning your own practice is, 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 you know, part, part of the aura around being a dentist, but I have dentists in our portfolio right now that love the clinical side and hate the HR side, hate the, the staffing and the, the systems and the coaching they need. And, and there's this feeling of frustration. And I think any, anyone that owns their own business can become myopic, but you only get to see the highlight reels of other dentists. You don't always have insight into their journey. And I think that, I think when I only ever see everyone's highlight reel, it makes me feel frustrated and resentful and Kudos to you for being out there and the, trying to make the world a better place. I think that getting their head right and really determining why you want to own a practice is, is powerful because there's a lot of dentists out there that struggle to admit they don't want to own a practice, but now it's an albatross around their neck. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, and what happens is, is and I've, I've seen this, man, I've done this 23 years, is they don't recognize it until year three, four, or five. And mm -hmm. once you're four or five hits, they realize, you know, I haven't taken a vacation in a year. I haven't been able to, you know, uh, if I'm sick, I'm still working and grinding it out. I just have to wear a face mask and act like I'm not sick because I can't lose production for the day. Because if I lose production for the day, I'm also going to have to pay my employees. And so mm -hmm. I'm not only am I in the negative, but I'm deep into the negative. And so, you know, th th there's so many things that are detrimental as an entrepreneur, not even like just dentists aside. I mean, just as an entrepreneur, there's so many things that, you know, affect the business that, you know, if they're okay with and they have, they don't have to have an answer for everything, but if they're aware of it, okay. And they still firmly are convicted that, yeah, I do want to own my business. I want to build this asset. I, I want to have, you know, a little bit more independence in my life. Then, you know, I, I see why they, they do it. But if, if that's not really the answer, you know, it, it it causes concern sometimes. I would love for any dentist out there that is not happy. I think they need to build a team that they talk to every day, whether it be their CPA, whether it be their, yeah. their equipment rep, whether it be their marketing team. I, I think they need someone to 
be that sounding board for them around what's happening in their practice and, and kind of center them. And, you know, we're so blessed, Andre and I, my business partner, I mean, like, uh, we talk 20 times a day and Friday mornings we set aside just for us, you know, we call it special time, nine 30 awesome. to, to 11. We, we sit down and have coffee and just talk about the business. And it would be so lonely to not have that. I, 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 I think they need to build a team and, and, you know, of people that they trust around them. Yeah. I know yeah. we have Jessica none in common. Uh, yeah. she's great at that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. That, that's what she does. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's it, her specialty. It, it's funny you say that. So like the, the single most important and not, you know, by any, any means, I don't have all the answers or the best answers or whatever, but some of the best advice I got, and I stole it from somebody else is as an entrepreneur, you should always have a mentor. And I, mm -hmm. I took it a step further. I think dentists should have two mentors, a business mentor that doesn't, that is not a dentist and it's mm -hmm. not a spouse because they're not talking about work when they go home and then yep. they need a clinical mentor. They need somebody that's about five to eight years older so they can still relate to them, not 20 or 30 years older, but five to eight years older that they can say, Hey, I'm going to send you this x-ray. And I have never seen this before. Can you tell me what this is? And, and there's no apprehension or embarrassment of not knowing. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times, they don't have that, you know, they really, they feel they're operating on an Island and you know, their, their major confidant is their assistant. Uh, it might be their office manager. It might be their supply guy. I get a lot of questions when it comes clinically and business wise. And, and it's interesting to me, you know, it is important to build your team of trusted advisors, but I think that the single most thing that can really help the headspace, the, the dentist being an entrepreneur, business mentor, clinical mentor. I agree. Yeah. That's amazing. So Eric, what's next for you? What do you, what's coming up, man? I got a vacation coming up, so I'm looking forward to that, to be honest. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. No, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working towards my MBA right now. Um, I get that closed out at the end of the year, which is cool. I've got four more classes left and, uh, I'm pretty excited about having that. And then, uh, you know, I've got a couple of small little things with regards to that in the works. So. Man, congratulations. I, I, I've heard your name for a long time and it's so amazing to finally get to chat with you, but that was your body dental marketing. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Thanks for having me, Eric. I appreciate you.